Today is the 25th of November 2019 and I'm here to interview Ivor Tiefenbroom about his late father and about himself. Let me ask you a little about your father. Yes. What was his name and where did he come from? My late father, Jack or Jan Tiefenbrunn, was born in, near Krakow in Poland. But at the age of four or five or something, he moved to Austria. His father was a farmer, so he grew up. He was a farmer's son. And he came to Glasgow after the Anschluss, after the Germans and seized um, Austria. And he was just before the outbreak of the, of the Second World War. Did he come all by himself? He was actually in charge of a group of children. And he, I think, had already just turned 20, 18. And... Um, his sister was in Glasgow, and she mentioned to people that she had a brother. The originally, the, the British government agreed to allow in, I think, 15, not 1,500, um, about 5,000 uh, kids from various places. And uh, these children were, were under the age of 12. And of course, a lot, many of them had brothers and siblings or were sisters. And so the government then, in response to requests by the Jewish community and others, agreed to take another 500. So his sister was in Glasgow. She mentioned her brother, and that's how he got here. So his parents, did they survive? My grandmother survived. She got into Switzerland as for medical treatment and she was friendly with a connection with the Swiss consul or something in Vienna or the Swiss embassy. And uh, she needed medical treatment and she got into Switzerland. Once they deemed her cured, they, she had to return. And at that time, of course, a lot of, most of Europe was Nazi controlled, but she managed to get out from Switzerland into, through France and across Spain, and uh, then went out from Portugal and on a boat, and that took her via Cuba to New York. And she lived in New York throughout the war, separate from her, separated from her children. And once the war was over, my father got permission to, he was a stateless alien, and he got permission to bring her to Glasgow in, I think, 1952. And she lived for a couple of years before she passed away, but she at least was united with her children from whom she had been separated for such a long time. Her husband was murdered in Buchenwald, and he was taken there. The Germans kept on rounding people up. Sometimes they took you someplace, sometimes they didn't. And my father and his father were both rounded up a few times, and my father would never talk about it. So we don't really have all the information or knowledge about exactly what happened to him. But we do know that his father was taken to Buchenwald and he was murdered there. And the story that was reported to my grandmother was that he stood up or stood out in some way and objected to something and he was shot on the spot. If that's true, it's probably as good a way as any to go when you're in the clutches of the Nazis. But we also know from letters he wrote to my grandmother that they were freezing and starving. And that, of course, was in Germany and before the outbreak of the war. And he spent some two or three months, I think, or maybe, in Buchenwald. The real story of the Holocaust and the way the Germans 
treated uh, the Jews in particular, but other people as well, is never really fully understood or even explained comprehensively. But it's not a pretty story. So in the beginning, they killed people in smaller quantities and they slowly increased the, the Sometimes there was such a widespread objections that people, some people were released, but eventually they just got down to open wholesale slaughter of innocents. And then your father, your father came to, to Glasgow and he was alone. So how did, how did he cope with that? Well, he wasn't alone because his sister lived in Glasgow and he was brought in by a Jewish family who were extremely nice to him. Uh, you know, these kids that came here, they were kept in different ways. Some were kept in groups uh, of, uh, uh, together, uh, the early ones from Germany and so on. And some were distributed amongst British families, Jews and non-Jews, mainly Quakers, the non-Jews. And they took these children into their homes. Um, but they weren't all uh, uh, Jewish and uh, I, I know people who were brought in and taken into a Scottish home, farmers, took in three children and their mother. So people, some people were exceptionally generous and good-hearted and took on a big, big burden and responsibility to take individual children or, in the case of one of my friends, an entire family. Well, mine is the father who was... How old was your father at that time? My father came here, he was 18, when he arrived. So was he expected to work when he was taken in by a family? When the Nazis took over Austria, they were greeted warmly. Not a shot was fired. They were welcomed. And the first thing they did was announce that they were going to round up the Jews. My father, his father, <coughs> was a farmer. He was a clever man. And he played every weekend. He played chess with the local um, head of the council or whatever, the, whatever they call the, what would you call them? Uh, the mayor or whatever. And the, also the priest and the doctor. So they played ch chess together at the weekends and uh, he, my father was friendly with the mayor's son who was a next door neighbor and they were the same age. And when the, the Anschluss happened, people suddenly came out of the woodwork like their cleaning lady or whatever, the housemaid suddenly appeared in a Nazi uniform, you know, and it should be. And although, although she wasn't personally hostile to them, and hadn't ever been, but the mayor's son, when the German representative military person came to the town and asked for them to hand over the Jews, he pointed out his pal, uh, Jan, Yannick, my Grandpa, my father, and said, he's a Jew, they're Jews. So they literally were given 20 minutes, half an hour, to pack a small bag and leave, and to be shipped out and to Austria, to Vienna. And uh, my grandfather went to the bank and uh, to withdraw his savings. And when he got to the bank, uh, they announced, pronounced that Jews didn't have savings. All the money that Jews had, had been stolen from the people of Austria and so on. And so there was nothing there. So in a matter of 20 minutes, they suddenly found themselves dispossessed of the small holding and, and the workshops and the things they did. He was a farmer and he worked in repairing machinery and his wife cooked and baked and did things. So they earned a living through their labor and effort and 
personalities and so on, and skills, suddenly in the space of 20 minutes they were homeless, dispossessed, penniless, and taken to Vienna. In Vienna, they were housed in a, a Jewish home in a district which had quite a lot of Jews and which was kind of declared to be a Jewish area. And it was a top floor flat and a very elegant building where the people who owned the house with maybe five or so rooms suddenly found that they were looking after four, or five, four families of strangers. And they, they all lived there. And Jews were prohibited to have any uh, fruitful or, or remunerative employment, and, but were all told that they had to stop being parasites on the German peoples and had to work for a living. So my father and his father were appointed as the kind of trainees of a of a, a man who if the word escapes me a locksmith type uh, uh, person and uh, that lasted for about six months until the whole thing kind of he left and his father was was murdered. But that was a very unsettled six months. They were constantly being rounded up and harassed. And the Germans played this game of rounding people up and tormenting them and basically disorientated and dehumanizing people. And my grandmothers had a sister who had a very fashionable paps the most, or one of the most fashionable dress shops, ladies' dress shops in Vienna. And she had helped her sister there. And so she worked with her when they were in, in Vienna. But of course, all these things were closed down. and they, These sh sh Jewish businesses weren't allowed to trade with non-Jewish people. And they were ostracized, dehumanized, humiliated beaten regularly, robbed repeatedly, and murdered uh, on an ad hoc basis and eventually on a wholesale yeah, industrial basis. So that's what happened to my father's, my father and his family. And, and once he was here, what, what did he do, your father? Did well, he... he worked for H.B. Livingston, and they were a hosiery company. And he worked, because of his talents, in maintaining the machines and setting the machines and repairing them. And he could also make machines, which he went on to do. And after uh, work, Harry Livingston and the, the people the Jewish people in Glasgow were amazingly hospitable uh, to him and by and large to most people. Although my auntie Gretel was never entirely happy with the people that she was allocated. who looked after her, but it was very difficult, I think, for a 12-year-old child. Uh, and they probably found, they were quite old, probably found her quite difficult. And they, but anyway, they both survived. And my father worked on that kind of work, uh, which was considered vital for the war effort, all the, because that's what was mainly the product. And he was also served in the, in the, def in, in kind of fire brigade services and, Seems to spend a lot of time when doing ferries running about on roofs and things. Um, and that was not untypical of Jews who were in the hosiery or textile or network trade. So he, after the, the war, he started his own business. Uh, he got a bit, uh, he got support from H.P. Livingston, from Harry Livingston. 
and he started off by making machines for them, but he did other things as well, and his business rapidly became more general engineering. He was a very gifted natural engineer. He also studied uh, uh, what became the, uh, the Glasgow University, the tech, um, Strathclyde eventually, uh, where he was a far better student than I was much later. But uh, my brother's son, Jan, became a good student there, so, so I was the only one that was a bit of a disgrace. Uh, well, don't be too sure. <laughs> and uh, so my father bought a living for himself, and one of the girls in the factory fancied him. She was always claiming to have some problem with her machine to get Jack to come over, and while she batted her eyes at him. My father, once when my family, my sister, my brother, my mother and myself uh, were having dinner on a Friday night, which was the only time we saw my dad because he was spent most of his life working. And we, my sister asked my dad, Daddy, why did you marry mommy? And he said, when your mother was young, she used to bat her eyes all the time like this. And then he went on eating his food. So my sister naturally trapped, tricked by this approach. <laughs> she said, well, wh why did she batter? And my father said, I don't know. She said, why not? He said, he said because after we get married, she stopped. <laughs> my father had a great sense of humour, and so did my mum. So they, uh, they spent a lot of their life laughing. And uh, so, so he bought a life for himself in Glasgow. And his sister uh, lived in Glasgow and eventually had a, a big family of her own. I remember you told me when I last asked you about it that your mother had uh, her father had a very interesting story well i think jews all had interesting stories i mean in these days for a long time we've been fortunate that jews haven't had interesting stories let's hope that continues but it certainly is not universal but my mother's father had come from Breslatovsk or a place a shtetl close to Breslatovsk. And his father was a very uh, renowned rabbi and studied under the Gaon of Vilna. So he was a, a Gansi Macha, as a religious figure. But my grandfather, my mother's father, uh, had been born when his father was already an old man to his second wife, maybe his third, but his second wife. So, um, my my grandfather uh, had a stepfather, and anyway, he and after the nineteen o five revolution, he came to Glasgow, uh, possibly on his way to America, like so many Jews, possibly not, because a lot of Litvaks came, and although Breslatovsk wasn't didn't make you a Litvak. That part of the continent, the border was always changing. Every few months, I think, they changed it. So it was the same kind of people, same kind of culture. And my mother's uh, mother was one of three sisters who had also left after the 1905 revolution, who also were children of a rabbi in... in um, one of the Baltic countries, I have to think of the name. And um, so they, they came to Glasgow because they ran away because there was reactions against Jews and there was strife and conflict and people were killed. And so the government would retaliate against 
casualties and whether they were involved in anything or not, I have no idea, very doubtful. But they, they used to joke that they'd, they had to run away because they were involved in some revolutionary activity. But I can't imagine it would have been very serious. So they came from Vilna, near Vilna. And uh, they arrived in Glasgow. My grandfather then, of course, met my grandmother there, uh, in, here in Glasgow. And in the First World War, mm -hmm. he had the uh, There was pressure placed by Jews, largely, against Jews who didn't serve in the army. Because Jews who came from Russia and who weren't long-established citizens of the UK were not conscripted. And Russia was Britain's ally, but the Russians didn't make arrangements to have these people conscripted into the Russian forces. Um, but the Jewish community felt embarrassed that some of their number, who were all doing war work anyway, as most people were, and he was a craftsman, mainly in clothing and machine and such like. And they, they built coffins. So he, that's what they did. And unfortunately, in the First World War, coffin manufacturing was a, a demanding uh, challenge because there were so many required and the casualty rates were so appalling. So he was given the choice anyway that he could volunteer for the British Army or go and fight for the Russian army. And his wife, uh, and he, they were both communists, mad, crazy communists, um, as many Jews of the time were. And they thought they would save the, but they weren't religious, although they came from this very religious background and were steeped in Judaism and the, the learning and knowledge and traditions and culture and history of Judaism. But they were ultra left wingers. And uh, he decided his wife was the, the one who th that was the, the brains of this decision that he'd be far safer fighting in the Russian army than in the British army. Because people, of course, were aware of the appalling the attrition rate that Britain suffered in the First World War. But Russia was worse, hard as it is to believe. And so he volunteered to fight the Russian army in Russia. And many thousands of British Jews volunteered and went to Russia, and many from Scotland. And also there were people who came from the Baltic states who had come to Britain who also were in the same category. And they also went back uh, to, they were mostly minors. And a lot of the early Jewish immigrants to Scotland were minors and to places like Merthyr Tidville had almost 100,000 Jews over 100 years ago. Muslim went to South Africa to look for gold after that. And so much of our history has involved change and displacement and so much is forgotten and not understood. And I think it's quite common that my parents didn't really talk about uh, much about their childhood. It's only when people get quite old do they start to and my father, maybe if he had lived for another 10 or 20 years, he might have started to tell us things, but he didn't ever. But in any event, my mother's father was landed in Murmansk, and he was put in a train to be, for transport to the front. And the train left uh, the, the north of Russia the port, and it was stopped. And the people robbed, they were robbed and killed. 
And of the six or eight hundred people on that train, only a handful, I reckon, to have survived. And these volunteers uh, who went to Russia mostly perished. And when they left Britain, they had no paperwork. And when they tried to get back, many of them weren't re allowed to come back. Those that survived the whole horror of the First World War and the, rev this, the revolution in, uh, in Russia. So my grandfather, uh, my Russian grandfather, he managed to, to escape with a handful of other soldiers from Britain. And they were all well equipped, they are, you know, and it's because they had some wealth and watches and some money that, of course, they were murdered by the Russians. Uh, their own people murdered them. And um, he and about half a dozen other men found them, escaped and found themselves alone. And I think there were eight of them. And they didn't know what to do. And most of them wanted to keep heading towards the front and get trains, walk south. And, and one of them wanted to go somewhere else. And some of them had family or, uh, and uh, home, historical places where they'd come from. And so my grandfather ended up walking south and he decided to go to brest to see his mother and his stepfather. And he, he got there and arrived the morning after a pogrom in which his stepfather had been murdered and his mother had died on the spot eh, from a heart, heart failure. At the, at the, and that's the story that he told. And then he had no idea what to do. There was nobody left in the village, and nobody he knew. His parents were gone. His sister had been by the same father, had come through Glasgow at one point with her husband and went to America, to Chicago, to live. And uh, he had helped her make that journey when she stayed in Glasgow and got a plane, uh, a boat from here. So he ended up wandering about Russia. And at one stage, he was picked up by a unit of guards, a guard regiment. They were all very tall, good-looking, fit men, and they wanted to know who he was wandering about. Everyone was interrogated. You were either a friend or foe. And in Russia, you were either going to die or, or, or join the side that, that allowed you to survive. And he explained his background. And they didn't believe he was a soldier. And he wasn't really. But they gave him a rifle and asked him to hit a target. And he fired at this target some distance away. And he was a crack shot. And my, he told me this story when I was a child, I was 10 when he died in our house. And I thought it was a Bobby Mesa, you know, a story your grandfather tells you, but not real. And uh, very strangely, 10 years later, I was in the middle of a war with people shooting at each other, just like he had been <laughs> when I was in the Six Day War in Israel. And um, so, he, he managed to stick with this guard regiment for, uh, and, uh, but he, and as long as they headed, he thought he would go south because the British and the French and the Americans had intervened in the war, uh, uh, in the Revolutionary War against the Bolsheviks in, support, in the south. And he, despite his political views, wanted to go home to his wife and children. 
And uh, so he escaped from this regiment. And the way he did it, he told me, was that when they were camped for some time by a river, uh, he'd left some of his things, wandered about and left some of his things under trees and rocks and corners and things. And um, then when the day they were leaving in the morning when people were bathed in the river, he cast off his jacket and swam under water. And uh, the Russians fired at him at his jacket until it sank. And he went under the, into the shore at a point he'd identified and hid amongst the rushes and breathed breathe through a, 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 a bit of a tree or something. And I, of course, didn't believe this at all. And it then, but it did turn out, it's very strange life, that when I went to school, that I was capable, unlike, I think, anyone except possibly one other student of swimming up and down the pool two or three times underwater. <laughs> that I had the ability to swim underwater for quite considerable distances. I don't think it probably as much as my grandfather, but then no one was ever shooting at me. And um, so that was, he came back, he got to the, the south of Russia and he had to cross the lines between the Western powers and the, the, the revolutionaries. And when he was trying to do that, he was shot at by guards. And he was crawling at the time. And in despair, he rolled on his back and swore in the best class region, for fuck's sake. And um, what the people shooting at him, the story goes, were from Glasgow. And recognising his accent, they said, where are you from, Jimmy? And he said, Glasgow. And they took him to the commanding officer who heard his story. And he'd been away for some considerable time, a year or something or more, a year and a half. And the, he said, look, if you report to us, you'll be here for another, who knows how long. If you want, I will give you a, safe, a documentation for you to leave and head, make your own way. You'll get on a, a ship, a supply ship that will take you to Constantinople. And, uh, and so I did. And he worked there to make enough money and things to survive. And he did work on various things. And he, I don't know how long he stayed there, but long enough to get to the south of France on a boat. And from the south of France, he went to, walked across France. And he hated the French, you know. I, after all the things that happened to him in Russia, I asked him, I said, Grandpa, Zaidi, do you hate, you must hate the, the Russians? He said, no, no, he said, I don't hate the Russians. They killed everybody, he said, but I hated the, he hated the French. He asked, why do you hate the French? He said, because when I had nothing, and try to cross France. If you took something out of a field to eat, they would chase you away or shoot at you. Or he said, whereas in Russia, the poorest peasant would share whatever they had with a complete stranger. So I thought that was a very um, surprising uh, view, but he probably had, was biased towards the Russians and the hardships. So, despite all their, their, their craziness. So if he then got a boat that took him to the south of, of uh, the UK. And he got ashore, because often they were turned away. 
But he landed in a pretty obscure place, and it had a tradition of dealing with Jewish people. And so they believed his account and everything. And uh, I need to remember the name of that town. And, we all, and uh, so he was back in the UK. Then he made his way somehow or other to Glasgow. And he arrived in the Gorbals. And he to asked, knocked on the neighbor's door down on the ground floor and asked the neighbour to go up stairs to the third floor or wherever where they lived, third floor, and t t tell his wife that he was home because he didn't want to give her a shock or just appearing or maybe finding out. One of my cousins who passed away recently said probably was worried in case she had another husband by then. And uh, he went upstairs and went home and went back to his workplace as a furniture maker, where he worked all the hours. He worked his main job every day to nine o'clock at night, and at the weekend he worked in a secondary job in the Saturday afternoon. And on Sundays he worked in, a, in, a, in his own account in the afternoons. So he was a very industrious man. They were communists. And his wife always had a big bowl of soup and food on the stove. And anyone in the Gorbals who was hungry could go to their house and eat. And my grandfather, Mazedi, was a very slim man. Very slim. And the story in the Gorbals was he was starving to death because when he eventually got home from working, there was no food left for him. So, <clears throat> so that, that was my family background. And your father, uh, going back to him, he started his own business. Is that the business you joined him with later in Well, life? my father wanted me to be in his business because I had... Uh, a bit of the engineering bent about me. And he thought I was his oldest son. My younger brother was eight years younger than me. And when I was about 12 or so, or 13, my father was told that he had uh, cancer and he'd be dead in six months. Uh, and, uh, and he turned out to die, he lived another 25 years, and he was the oldest survivor of his type of cancer anywhere at the time. And, uh, but he wanted me in, in his business. And I did work for him, but I said, Dad, I'm off. And I mar got married to a girl who wanted to go and live in Israel. So I said, OK, we we'll won't live in Israel. <laughs> Is it? But and we did move to Israel, but my father got so seriously ill, and my bro sister and brother were younger and at school, and so I came back to Glasgow. But I'd also started an idea of making a turntable, a product, because I thought my dad needed a product to make. And when I came back, I said, I'll come back, but I'm going to make that product. And I'll do that, because I didn't want to work for my dad. Uh, you know, it's hard being in the family business, you know. Uh, and I, I, it wasn't my choice in life to work. I didn't want to be my, have my dad as my boss. And also, my father and mother, all they did was talk shop all the time in the house. It drove me mad. And so I never spoke a word about what I did in my house to, to my wife or children. So they probably had no idea what I was doing. So, so I started Lynn Products and uh, based on, to make this turntable. Originally, I was really constructing it. Almost, much of the all the machining was done in Castle. Eventually, took control of the processes and broadened the range of the company. 
and it still goes, and so does Castle, uh, despite the fact that these fields are extremely difficult for companies in the UK, especially in Scotland. Why especially in Scotland? Well, because the industrial base, heartland of Scotland, is gone, and modern industry is much more based in the south. And big companies, um, be, they, they don't want suppliers or that are more than an hour or two hours drive away from them. They want everything to be on their doorstep. So that's tough for Glaswegian companies. And you never thought of re relocating to England? No. No, I didn't. I've got a son, my oldest boy, lives in London. I don't know how he can take it. He spends an hour and a half going to work and an hour and a half going. And he works, of course, all the time in the mobiles and computers. And, but it's a hell of a way to live. I also remember, Ivor, that you told me when your father passed away, um, he had told you a secret about his bookcase. You remember talking about that? Yes, what happened was that when my father was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and they told him that he had about six months to live. And so he said to me, if anything should happen to you, he took me into his office. He said, if anything should ever happen to me, I want you to know that the most valuable things that our family possess are in a cupboard in, hidden in the corner of this bookcase and the and two sides of his office. And I said, yes, Dad. I never thought about it. And then a long time later, 15 years later, and I had long, long left home and so on. My mother passed away. And I, it was left to me to clear the house, which had been left to my sister. But she lived in London and still does. So you truly had to empty the house and organize everything. My brother wasn't terribly well. And uh, I phoned my brother up one day, I said, Marcus, I said, did Dad ever mention something that he had hidden in a secret compartment in the corner of his bookcase? And he said, no, maybe he had, but Marcus would have forgotten. <laughs> the oldest one always remembers in a way that younger ones never do. So I don't know if my dad told Marcus or not, but, eh, or maybe he just relied on having told me. So I said, well, he did. Come on round to the house and we'll find it. So I took all the books out of the bookcase and I took the shelves out. And behind the end of the shelves, I could see that in the corner quarter of the bookcase that there was some screws and things, fittings. And when I removed these, I could... There were hinges, hidden hinges, at the base. And this section of the bookcase folded down. And inside the bookcase were all these things, mostly old books, rubbish, and old things that, you know, I don't know, old wallets and old uh, watches and lots of bits and pieces which may have had some value or a sentimental value, but I knew couldn't be what my dad was telling me about. And there was a pile of paper this deep and uh, it was all tied together. And when I took it out, I said to my brother, do you want to look at this? And he said, no. He said, you do it. That's my sibling's favorite phrase to me, I think was, you do it. <laughs> so I said, OK, and I took it home, tied it. I bet when I'd opened it, it opened a, a page that was 
a letter from the commandant of Buchenwald concentration camp to my grandmother saying that my grandfather had died. He said, heart could stop in his heart had stopped. Yes. And uh, to get his ashes, she had 14 days or 10 days and she had to pay so much money. And that's what the Germans did. Even when they murdered people, they sold their ashes. Everything they did was for money. Carefully documented, calculated, gathered, you know. Quite extraordinary. The obsession they had with money. And uh, they hated the Jews if they had any money, of course. But Jews have never had an obsession about money, although we're often accused of it. And some may have, but it's not, it's not endemic, it's not buried into our culture or our attitude, what life's about. So that was, eventually I went through it all. It took a number of years and I thought, I have to do this. Because it was too close to the death of my mum and everything to start. And it documented the story of my father's family's attempt to escape the Nazis in Austria. And all the, the efforts they made. For instance, my dad and his sister had permission to go and live in Venezuela. But they did an offer in Glasgow, in Glasgow, Britain was much more attractive. But when my, and they had permission to travel through Britain to go to Venezuela. But when my sister got out and my father tried to use this document, the British said, no, no. This pass, this permit for you to travel through Britain to get a boat to Venezuela is or in South America, wherever it was, it is, um, is for Hansel and Gretel Tiefenbrunn, not for Hansel on his own. So they said it's not valid. So that's how people's lives were thrown away and how they perished over some bureaucrat's fanaticism. Anyway, he got to, he got to, to Scotland shortly, before, literally very shortly before, before the outbreak of the, the war. And he arrived in Glasgow, and which he loved, and the pay, and the people, and the kindness, and the, and uh, and he loved Scotland. And he he didn't experience any anti-Semitism. Well, funnily enough, we lived for a while in um, in Springburn, and my father bought a house there, and I was born in Springburn. And uh, when Israel became independent, there was a lot of anti-Jewish sentiment and it was a kind of mini pogrom thing where Jews were attacked in Glasgow and people threw bricks through the window. And that's the earliest memory I have of, as a child, of something smashing through the window into a into the, uh, our, our room. And, uh, but my father recognized that that was an aberration and I don't think it bothered him too much. But anyway, we moved to the south side, to Annette Street, where we were surrounded by Jewish people for a long time. I went back recently to the school I went to and. About 10 years or more ago, there wasn't a single Scottish kid in the Nate Street Primary School. Change days. It's a change the world. 
he loved Scotland and so did my mother. And he was a very sociable, good-natured, funny man. He loved humour and talking. And, and even both my parents always helped people all their days. And I've been very similar. And uh, so I've always done my best to help other people when I can. And so he had a profound impact on the people who he worked with, lived with, and the family and so on. And do you think he would have done that had he stayed back in, in Vienna if he hadn't been displaced? I'm pretty sure he would have been, because it was a culture of, of, of these people. You know, when life is hard, people can't survive too well on their own. A friend of mine once asked my father, a friend who lives in America now, he said, did you start Ivor's business for him? And my dad said, no. He said, when a man wants to dig a hole, he said, he needs, he doesn't need encouragement, he said, but he needs a shovel, he said. So I gave him a shovel to dig his own hole. Of course, he did help me get Lynn started. And uh, he said, he gave me a shovel. But of course, Lynn became, for a long time, became a much bigger and more viable business than Castle. I don't know that that's still the case. Castle's doing well, and it's a much different world today. Uh, so, but my dad, my mum and dad, they were brought up with the culture. Like, like my mum's father, you know, they, people helped people. That's the way life was. And I think I was brought up that way, and my, so were my siblings. And most of my family, I think, are very similar. You know, they, they help other people. At the end of the day, we're all just passing through, aren't we? So if we can make it a little bit better, you know. When I cleared out my parents' house, I was flabbergasted at how little they had in the house of any value. Virtually nothing. They weren't at all materialistic, you know. I, I'm not imitating them in any conscious way, and I've got lots of things that I appreciate and love in my house, but I've lived here for 43 or four years, so, so I haven't enjoyed it, but I think I must be the oldest veteran in the street now, so I'll be next in line, eh?